change of ER as theta changes. For a small increase in the angle, say 0.1 radians, you could approximate uh, the change in ER, which will be an angle, angle change, as uh, e theta times 0.1 radians. It would be the approximate change in ER as a vector change. I won't bother drawing a picture. If you want, you can think about that on your own. Likewise, the derivative of e theta is related to ER. It's negative ER. <clears throat> Should make some intuitive sense if the planet really is going counterclockwise so that these angles, uh, these vectors are rotating counterclockwise. A small increase in theta, which is related to a small increase in time, although we aren't thinking about time when I'm thinking about these derivatives. A small increase in the angle makes ER change from being in this direction to being more like this, which is sort of in the direction almost parallel to E theta. So it makes some intuitive sense that that would be true. And E theta changes from this to about like that, which is sort of in the direction of opposite of ER. So that's a little picture that can make some intuitive sense out of those derivative facts. Everything does depend on time, though, so we can use the chain rule to, do, to relate these to derivatives with respect to time. Um, the derivative of the ER with respect to time is first its derivative with respect to theta times the derivative of theta with respect to t, which I often will shorthand, like the book does, just write it as a theta prime here. And we know this derivative is e theta. Okay, that's a fact to just keep track of here. Uh, we can use the product rule on this equation to write the velocity vector in terms of ER and e theta. It's a product rule. Think about it quick. Take the derivative of the scalar. That's a scalar r, the length of the vector r. That's the derivative of the r dt. That's a regular scalar derivative. Times the vector er. So that's the derivative of the first times the second. Plus the derivative of the second times the first. The r is the, the first. Theta prime e theta is the derivative of the second with respect to t. It comes from here. It comes from the previous line there. It's a product rule for a scalar times a vector. Okay, there is such a product rule. We can also use a pro uh, well, we can now substitute this in for the velocity in the definition of j. Take v and substitute this expression. r prime means the rbt, primes mean derivative with respect to t here. And um, we can distribute, there's a distributive law that allows us to take this vector and put it in through the parentheses to get this cross product. And the cross product of this with this, the first cross product is zero, because it's got an ER cross ER, a vector cross itself. So it goes away, and so it simplifies to just this cross that, which is what you see here. The scalars can be factored out. The R's can combine to an R squared, and the theta prime can be factored out. We've got R squared theta prime times this vector. The length of that vector, the J without a vector symbol, the the j that's not bold faced can be the length calculated as the length of this. Since er and e theta are unit vectors, it turns out that cross product is also a unit vector and has length one. And so scalar j ends up equaling r squared theta prime for all t. You can put the t's in there. Rho is just my, my symbol for the um, formula for r as a function of theta. The book doesn't do that. r is a function of theta. Instead of doing yeah, it's the polar equation of the ellipse. I'm calling the function rho. So rho equals r, really. As a function of time, you can write it like this. This is true for all t, but it's going to be constant for all t. We've, we've already derived that. j was a constant vector. Its length is going to be a constant scalar for all t. This quantity, evidently, then, has to be constant for all t. While I put this mathematic code in here, I forgot. Let's see if I can remember why I got this code in here. Uh, here was the, here's sort of the better way to do it that I discovered, at least for a fixed initial upward velocity of 37,000 pitch. That would be in meters per second. Um, that's an elliptical orbit of a fictitious planet. This is interesting. Here are the graphs of x and y individually as functions of time. 
might be good to compare this. I, again, I'm forgetting why I have this code in here at the moment. It might be good to compare these graphs and think about it real quick because we're starting to run a lot of time. I might go a little over time today. I hope that's okay. We start over here. Uh, let's see. Red is the x coordinate. Y is a uh, red. A uh, blue is the y coordinate. At this point, the y coordinate starts out at zero. The x coordinate starts out at 1.5 times 10 to the 11. The x goes down first because you're moving to the left. The y goes up first because you're moving upward. When you reach the y max there, uh, that's going to be when you're at the peak, and that happens pretty quickly in time because the planet moves pretty quickly at first. You get to the valley for y down here more, or well, zero for y right here more slowly because the planet starts moving slow. And you can think about the same kind of thing with x. So you can think about those functions as functions of time as well. Um, oh yeah, okay, I was getting into why, I was trying to figure out if I could graph these functions, that, that was my goal here, the theta and the rho. Um, I use Mathematica's expanded arctangent function to try to get theta as a function of t. Uh, this does not work perfectly because it still gives you an output between negative pi and pi, and so you get discontinuities in the graph. I tried to fix those discontinuities um, by making a piecewise function. Beta here really is the same as theta. Uh -huh. I made an approximate piecewise function to try to estimate where these discontinuities were and added 2 pi and 4 pi uh, to get a better approximation for the angle uh -huh. graph if we allow the angle to go past 2 pi. Rho, the distance to the origin, has a graph that looks like this as a function of time. And you can think about these graphs, like for example, why does the angle one look the way it does? Um, initially, the angle's changing very rapidly in time because the planet's moving fast. Here, at this, this time, not many seconds, the planet's at the far point, the aphelion is moving slower. So theta, the derivative of theta with respect to time is smaller. Then it moves faster again as you approach the perihelion, the closest approach. And here are the dis distances. And you can see this is the perihelion right here, the closest approach, but that's minimized. And that matches this inflection point there. I was trying to see if, if theta uh, of rho of t times rho prime was really constant. And this was the point where something went wrong. But possibly it's in my formula here. I was thinking this formula would work. But I have to think about this more because I wasn't getting a constant value for that. I got two different numbers here at these two different time values. I tried plotting this. It wasn't constant. It was an interesting graph but not constant. So it might be some formula that's wrong in my A of T here. My error is swept out. It also wasn't working out that this function was working right. If you do plot it, it does seem straight. So it does seem like equal areas are being swept out in equal times. But um, I was having trouble matching it with the true area of the ellipse. I don't have the details here. I think I cut them out. The area of an ellipse is pi times a times b, where a is the semi-major axis and b is the semi-minor axis. I wasn't getting it to match. I'm not sure if it was a numerical error or if it's a problem with my area swept out function, or maybe any integrate wasn't working. I tried doing it for a toy solar system as well, where I took k equal 1. And that does give you better time scales. And the numerical integration seemed to work better. Um, but it still wasn't working out perfectly. I think in the end, A was this and B was this, and pi times AB was different than the area swept out after one period. So I'm not sure what went wrong there, OK? And if you're not following me, I don't blame you, because I kind of remember that fast. I was trying to confirm the area swept out was correct over the entire period of the planet's motion. But it wasn't working out right. You're putting this whole thing on. Yep. So you can look for my error. My error might be theoretical or it might be a mathematical error. Mathematical error. Anyway, we did derive, believe it or not, the, first, the uh, second law here. Uh, where, did, where is the final conclusion? We, we proved 
that the air, uh, the equal areas were swept out in equal times uh, somewhere. Did I have the conclusion anywhere? Ah, where's the conclusion? I think the conclusion ultimately, okay, was that dA dt equaled this. Yeah, okay, dA dt was that, but that thing was equal to the magnitude of j, one half the magnitude of j, which is constant. So in essence, we did prove it, if you believe the work. How about the first law? One question. This is just, mm -hmm. I, I feel like the, the most of the stuff we did for the second law is assuming that the orbit was an ellipse. Law. Yeah. Yeah. That. Uh, certainly, the animations seem to verify that if we were assuming it. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think we were, but it sort of felt like that because that's what we saw in the animations. Anyway, we're running low on time, and I, I do want to go a little over time here, but I want to get you out in a reasonable time, maybe five minutes late. Um, this is an outline of the derivation of Kepler's first law, the law of the ellipse, in the book. Um, it is also related to the differential equation, which can be written like this. Before I wrote it as the second derivative of r with respect to t, but that's also the first derivative of b with respect to t. Um, essentially, the, the main idea here is if you write it as a differential equation for dv with respect to theta, it becomes an equation that can be easily integrated. The dependence on the, der the derivative of b with respect to theta is easy to integrate. And by choosing your axes appropriately, it, as we talked about doing, making the velocity vector perpendicular to the position vector, it turns out that the constant of integration can be taken to be vertical. When, uh, and you can think of that as being something you could solve for when theta is zero. Where k and j are numbers, k is g times m, and j is the the length of the j vector, r cross v, for some constant e, and the e is meant to be suggestive, not that it's the number e, but it's that it's the eccentricity of the ellipse, if it is an ellipse. Now, that's not clear why it should be the eccentricity or why it should be less than one for a planet, anything that has an ellipse, but you can choose some e where that would be true, based on choosing your coordinate system correctly based on whatever, however long C is, there would be some E where that's true. I think I need to keep going and not take questions here so we can get as far as we can here. Um, it turns out you can compute J based on these new equations and based on thinking about cross products and the formula for cross products. Uh, and you get that J actually equals this, the vector J in terms of theta, and by the way, I did have the cross product calculation here with Mathematica and confirmed this was true, or this cross this. And if you take magnitudes on both sides, you can write this equation. That equation can be solved for r as a function of theta to get this, and that's starting to look familiar now. I hope you remember from chapter the end of chapter 11 that that's looking like the polar equation of a conic section, an ellipse, parabola, circle, or hyperbola. You could put it into that form from that chapter if d was equal to this. That was the directrix, so we didn't really worry about what directrix, directrices were. Okay? For us, we were, there were just quantities in this equation. If e is between 0 and 1, it will be an ellipse. If e is greater than 1, it will be a hyperbola, just one branch of the hyperbola. If e equals 1, which would be very rare in real life, it would be a parabola. If e equals 0, it would be a circle. That does effectively prove Kepler's first law, okay? because that is the polar equation for such a thing, at least in the case where e is between 0 and 1. What about Kepler's third law? Uh, from the previous derivation, we got this equation. Um, it's, from this point on, it's really just a bunch of algebra. It was a couple exercises in the book, and you can look at them. I, I outlined the derivation from those exercises, but it's really just a bunch of algebra. 
Um, we define a new variable called p to be j squared over k, so that we can write the polar equation more simply. We do recall that c does equal a times e, where c again is the distance between the center of the ellipse and the fo either focus, since we define the eccentricity by that equation. And if I call this function rho of theta, I can find rho of 0 and, and rho of pi, either way, to determine how the semi-major axis depends on p and e. Okay, it's just a bunch of algebra here. It's, it's not clear why this should be true other than just following your algebra. And then it's a matter of doing more algebra along with the Pythagorean theorem. And here we really are assuming the orbit is an ellipse. This assumption is implicit in, in this derivation. If you let capital B be this point right up there, um, the, folk, the sun is right here, your planet is along the ellipse. This is the center of the ellipse. You can draw a right triangle like this. This distance is C. Turns out this distance is A by the definition of an ellipse as being the set of points where the sum of the distances between the foci is constant. Turns out that's A. And this is B here, and you can use the Pythagorean theorem to that triangle, that right triangle, to say this, C equals A times B. You can solve that for B squared and ultimately for B to get this. Uh, what else? Uh, now you think about the area swept out over the entire period as the planet goes around the sun. Uh, since one half j is ultimately the area swept out as a uh, the derivative of that with respect to time, a is a linear function of t, and you can write that. And if you plug in the period capital T for little t, the total area of the ellipse is this, but the area of an ellipse is also this. Uh, which you can write in terms of P and A like that, and then you can set this equal to this and solve for what? T squared ultimately. Square both sides, solve for T squared to get the final conclusion, yay. Okay, so very quickly, it's a bunch of algebra manipulations, defining new quantities, substitutions, et cetera, and manipulations to get the final conclusions with the constant being 4 pi squared over g times m. I want to end class by saying praise to God that the universe is finely tuned, that this all works. I do praise God. I'm serious. I'm a serious Christian about that. Okay? Um, you know, scientists, astrophysicists, if you've heard about the finely tuned universe, they try to explain it away by saying, oh, there's a multiverse. Our universe is just one of many multiverses, many universes in the multiverse. And those other universes might not have finely tuned constants. We just happen to, and so of course we would observe our universe to be hospitable to life. Um, I think there's a simpler explanation: is there's one universe, and God did it and designed it that way. Uh, but even if there's a multiverse, God did that too. And because it's good that gravity follows an inverse square law, because and not, for example, an inverse. Uh, R to the 2.01 power law, because what happens in such a situation? Notice instead of 1.5 here, I have 1.05. 1.505. What happens if it was an inverse R to the 2.01 power law? Uh, well, let's just say we wouldn't live <laughs> anymore. Because the orbit is not so nice anymore, and that's not numerical error. <laughs> So we would not be able to survive, okay? The fact that it's an inverse square law exactly is important for life. It's finely tuned. All right? <laughs> and that's the end of today's class. Thanks. That's the first time I've seen a uh, Pythagorean theorem of c squared plus b squared equals a squared. Yeah.